Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, coming and uh, talk about this in August. Um, so I came to talk about uh, the economy of the state of Washington. And I want to make a few comments, if that's OK. And we'll stand for questions and suggestions. So uh, the economy of the state of Washington right today, I think, is a uh, best of times and worst of times scenario. And I want to start with the best of times. Uh, it's the best of times because uh, we have robust economic growth in our state. It is, of course, not uniform, but it is robust. I think it's something to celebrate that uh, we've just passed the largest transportation package investment in the future economic growth of this state in Washington state history. I want to thank your organization for your advocacy at long last to get that done. I think it's great that we made the largest investments in our educational infrastructure in Washington state um, history. I want to thank you, this organization, for your advocacy to invest in the educational success so we can have great em employees and entrepreneurs to continue our technological advance in, the, in this state. And uh, perhaps most uh, impressive, uh, we have job creation in the last two years a greater, at a greater rate than 48 other states. So we have a lot of things to celebrate about our economy in the state of, of Washington uh, today. And since it's kind of vacation time, it would be great if I just stopped my presentation right now and we can go on to cheerier subjects. Uh, but we can't because it's also the worst of times because we have um, a threat to the economy of the state of Washington that is clear, present, immediate, and severe, which is a clear and present danger to the economy of the state of Washington, which if it is not fixed, uh, it is very clear we'll have very gravest, grievous damage in the prospects of ourselves and our kids ability to have a meaningful, productive economy in the state of Washington. And I want to start uh, our discussion today about uh, the issue that we're going to be talking about by describing the urgency and reason why we're here today. Uh, we are here today because we have an urgent problem facing our state. And it demands our state to act because the price of inaction is significant, permanent, and, se and severe if we do not act. And I want to start the first thing I say about this is there is a choice to be made in our state in the next several months. And that is a choice to do nothing about this current threat or to do something about this current threat. And I want to talk about the consequences of inaction before I say anything else. Because the consequences of inaction are profoundly damaging to the economy of the state of Washington. I want to just start by talking about things I've seen in my state in the last couple months. Because this is not hypothetical. This is real. It's personal. I'm living it on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to share to you what I'm seeing in the state of Washington. First, I got a picture of what I saw happened to our ski industry, which is an important industry. It's fun. It's, 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 you know, it's giggles jumping off those moguls, but it's an industry. And the industry last year was wiped out in the state of Washington because we didn't have anything to ski on. This is a picture, uh, I'm not even sure which area it is, but it's pretty much what you saw all last winter. And people who work in that industry didn't work this year because we didn't have snow. And the predictions are that this type of extreme event, a very different disruption of our normal climate, is what we are expecting to see off and on, not every year, but with more frequency in the years to come. Now, I've been here 64 years, and I've never seen uh, uh, two years as I've seen in these last two years, and this is just one indication of it. Next one. This is an irrigation ditch. I don't even know where it is, but it's the kind of thing you're seeing more frequently in our irrigated agricultural situation. Now, we got lucky this year because we've had a combination of extremely diligent farmers and ranchers who have been very creative trying to stretch water this year. And we're also lucky because our reservoirs were full when the season started. We dodged the bullet this year because our reservoirs were full when the season started. But next year, if we get another, another this El Nino developing, Katie, bar the door. Uh, this could be a, an extremely damaging agricultural economy situation 
next year. And again, although we cannot point, by the way, almost everything I'm going to talk about today, none of these specific climatic events that I'm going to talk about today can specifically be tied to carbon pollution and climate change. But on each of them, they will become more frequent and more intense, and the science is very clear about that. So what we're seeing in the ag industry is very significant dislocation. This is a picture of some kind of fish. I believe it's a salmon. It's dead, as are 50 to 80 percent of all the salmon in the Columbia River this year will be dead as a result of the water temperatures, which again are unprecedented. Now, we've had to shut down the sockeye season in the entire Columbia River, and the recreational industry, again, this is fun, but it also is an industry, and people can't fish this year, and they're buying less bait and lures at our bait shops. Uh, 50 to 80 percent of all the salmon are going to die this year because, because of the water temperatures, which are unprecedented. This is a young fellow doing a razor clam, which you aren't seeing this year. This is a picture you won't see in Washington beaches or Oregon beaches or California beaches this year because we've had to shut down the entire razor clamming industry because a bacteria that is associated with warm water has infected the clams and it'll kill you or paralyze you if you eat these clams. We've had to shut down the whole industry. We've also had so far had to curtail about half of the crab season this year, the commercial crab season, because of this bacteria. Now this bacteria again cannot be uh, uh, conclusively linked to warm water yet, but it appears highly likely it's associated with warm water events, which is unprecedented. And this type of event will become more frequent as climate change continues uh, to bite us. Here's a picture of some algae blooms. Let's go back just for a second show this algae bloom. Algae blooms, we're seeing unprecedented algae blooms associated with these warm water events uh, throughout Puget Sound. I'm not sure where, the, where this is taken, but I've seen this flying around when I've been going back and forth to some of our emergencies, like bridges out. I haven't seen them uh, up and down Puget Sound. Let's go to the next one. This one, I, um, my staff teases me about showing this to you because they think it's kind of nuts that I, I dive down into this level of discussion. But I think it's important to understand how, um, how devastating this can be to the industry. This is a picture of a, of a, a pteropod. Pteropods are these little microscopic creatures that basically are the base of the food chain in the world's oceans. 40% of salmon, this is the, the, the diet of the salmon. And they have a calcium carbonate uh, material that their body's made out of. They precipitate arginite or calcium out of the water to make their little body structure. As the waters become more acidic because of carbon pollution, which they are, they're 30% more acidic than they were in pre-industrial times, these little critters basically melt. They dissolve. Now, that sounds kind of cataclysmic, but it is the science. As the pH drops, they can't precipitate the calcium carbonate, and they essentially melt. And we are already seeing um, microscopic but real changes in the pteropods and the foraminifera in Bellingham Bay. And this is much more acute up in the Arctic, but it's working our way down right now. We don't, the scientific community does not know what will happen in the next 50 years, but it could be very dire if you have the base of the food chain end up uh, with these creatures not being able to exist. So we can just, I think we're done with the slides now, aren't we? We can go back with lights. And why don't you, I can't compete with pteropods, so why don't we shut that off there? Um, look, we, we got a state under siege here, and it's not hypothetical, and it's not peripheral. And it has real economic consequences to our state. Now, here's what I've reached a conclusion about. The legislative branch is incapable of providing 7 million Washingtonians what they deserve, which is some protection against this scourge. The legislature, despite my best efforts for the last two and a half years, I've extended every olive branch. I have formed every task force. I have every, had every discussion. Uh, known to man or beast, but the legislature is incapable of acting to doing something about this problem. So I am going to act using my existing executive authority under existing law. 
And that law is found in our Clean Air Act. Um, it is found in our Emissions Trading Credit System Act. It is found uh, in our, in our uh, existing statute that calls for the state to reduce its carbon emissions uh, to 1990 levels by, by the year 2020. So we have, a, a fortunately, statutory authority so that one branch of the government will not allow this destruction will continue unabated. And so we now will uh, be asking you to help our state adopt a rule that will help deal with this issue and meet our statewide goals of carbon reduction. And we do have specific statewide goals for carbon reduction because previous legislators have recognized the threat uh, that that poses. And uh, this executive authority exists and now it calls upon all of us to work together to figure out how to fashion a rule which will give Washingtonians a cap or a limit on the amount of carbon pollution that we put into the atmosphere um, uh, on an annual basis. Now, there is much work to be done to adopt that rule. And the reason there's a lot of work to be done is that we have many, many questions that are unanswered as to how to fashion that rule. So I have come to you with an open mind about how to fashion this rule that is most efficient, most economically productive, and most consistent with your operations, your market share, your technological challenges, and your view about how best for our state uh, to move forward. Now, the only decision I've made is to act, because I think the state demands action in this context. But we have many uh, issues that we now are going to be looking forward to. So let me, if I can, set forward about how we see this rolling out, playing out, and how I hope we can work together. So first off, we now, as you know, are, uh, have been engaged in discussions with you about this potential rule now for several weeks. We've had, I think, our staff's had maybe 30 meetings with a variety of, of groups. We intend to continue those in the upcoming months. We anticipate we would shoot for having a, what's called a 101 by the end of September, which would be a pre-draft of a draft of a rule to be able to at least start public discussion of this by the end of uh, this September. It would be our, our goal to have a 102 um, draft rule by, uh, uh, by December, by the end of December this year, which would lead to an application of the rule by next summer for the summer of 2016. And throughout that process, we would F, uh, uh, try to have the most transparent, open, comprehensive, uh, effective discussion with the business leaders, many of whom are in this room, to try to figure out the intricacies of this rule. And there are a lot of intricacies of this rule because of its broad application. But that would be our general time frame that we would shoot for. Um, now, if I can, uh, let me just list some of the things that I'm going to look for your advice on. A, uh, what should be the scope of this rule? What parts of the economy should be subject to the carbon cap? Uh, there are pluses and minuses to having the, the broader or narrower application of a carbon cap. Um, we have not made decisions about that. We are obviously aware of certain facts that would suggest we had to have some broad-based. We have an inordinate amount of our carbon pollution is associated with the transportation sector. I think everybody knows that, which would suggest the transportation sector should be included. But we have not made decisions about this, and we're going to look forward to your discussion about how to be handled that uh, with the most uh, robust economy that we can develop. Second. Uh, what type of efficiency systems can we develop under this rule to give businesses as much flexibility as they can to meet their regulatory requirements? The most obvious thing that we are thinking about is some type of credit system um, that might give the ability of businesses to have a flexibility or a compliance pathway that could involve in what you might call internal trading of credits 
so that a business that has excessive credits can swap or trade them with a business that has need for those credits and allow the private market to develop that trading system. That is one possibility. There are other compliance methods that could incentivize businesses to help others make investments in energy efficiency and obtain credits potentially against their compliance requirement. I'm sure there are a hundred other systems that might allow flexibility for businesses for multiple compliance uh, uh, pathways. Um, third, pacing of all this is obviously something that is important and pacing uh, how fast we want to wrap down our, our carbon emissions, particularly on a sector uh, by sector uh, a basis. So there's three big questions that uh, we would like your input on in the upcoming weeks to think about uh, this effort. Now, this is a big challenge for our state. This is, a, this is about as big a, a regulatory system that you can think of to try to develop that is efficient and economically productive. I will tell you some good news, though. Um, we have a lot of experience to draw on because we've had so many other jurisdictions move forward uh, with regulatory systems that do limit uh, emissions. Uh, not just for carbon. Obviously, we've had quite a number of jurisdictions that have moved forward to adopt carbon caps. Quebec, I talked to Minister, Prime Minister Quebec, they've had really good success for theirs with no measurable economic uh, dislocation. California, the eight uh, northeast states and the Reggie states, the eight northeast states have the Reggie program now for several years. Good success, robust economic growth. Many states in Europe have had caps with carbon, but we've had caps with other uh, pollutants as well. Sulfur dioxide, we've had a cap and trade system for 25 years in this state, originally developed by the first President Bush. We've had caps on nitrogen, nitrous oxide, nitrous, excuse me, NO2. And um, so we've had some experience to learn from. And fortunately, during the two-year program where, we, where I convened this bicameral bipartisan committee to look at some of these options. We had a very exhaustive review of all of the, the regulatory systems, really internationally, and we had some great things we learned from those that I think will, will help us a lot in crafting the most highly refined, efficient system that we can here. I mean, we literally probably have the best library of how to, how to do this the right way and how to do it the wrong way of probably anywhere in the world. So I think we've had a good uh, background for starters. But the most important folks who will have the most uh, knowledge where the rubber meets the road are, are everybody in this room. And that's why we are going to be looking forward to your input uh, in this regard in every fashion that you think uh, is useful. The method of us having this communication, uh, I talked to another group today about, they said, well, how, what's the structure of this communication? And the best structure I, I can think of is the more the better. And any possible way that we can listen to your suggestions, we will be amenable to. The one thing I think maybe, and Gary, I'll ask your advice about this, should we set up a system where where we should have a node of an, in, of an industry that our shop, either Department of Ecology or the governor's office, you know, goes through that node and then they distribute the communication network through the industry? Or should we just have a direct communication with all of the potential large emitters individually? Maybe we should give a little thought to that about the most efficient way to have this dialogue. Um, but in my view, just the most open, the most transparent, uh, the most honest discussion about this, um, the better, in my view, on, on how to go about this. I will tell you that uh, I think you understand how important this is to me as a governor. But it is not only from the perspective of reducing emissions. Uh, I want to do this the best way I can for the economy of the state of Washington. 
and there are right ways and wrong ways to do these regulatory systems. And I can tell you that I spent a lot of my time in the last several years studying those things. And I want to get this as right as we can. And I want to work with each one of you to do that. And that's, a, that's an honest offer. So uh, that's kind of a rundown on what we're thinking. And I would love to, uh, Gary, you want to run this discussion? Or Chris, do you want to run yeah. it? Or what do you think? So let me kick off maybe some, the question portion here, Governor. Uh, one to think about, you talked about aligning and tweaking. We're one of two states that counts uh, emissions by consumption versus generation. Is that something, you, as you think you go through this process, that we ought to look at and see, is that the right lineup to have? Should that have a change to it as we go forward? When you say change, you mean, you mean what? Uh, do we tweak it to back going to a generation-based uh, model versus a consumption-based model? We're one of two. We're kind of outliers in the, in the country about how we count uh, emissions. Well, uh, our, our immediate view, again, you know, we have not made final decisions on this, so I'm just going to give you a stream of consciousness. But in our situation with a statewide uh, cap, to some degree, we're going to need to look at, quote, consumption, where the emission takes place. Um, and um, uh, I think that that's something that we've got to recognize because we don't have an international system or a national system, except for the, the Obama administration rule. I can tell you that from what we have been able to ascertain, uh, this rule, there is no reason we don't think it will work really well with the, the administration coal-fired plant. We think they will dovetail very, very well. So we think that that's workable, tenable, enforceable, and not economically uh, disadvantageous. And, and, I'll, and I'll finish just in answer your question with that last part. Anybody who has a bottom line, and everybody in this room has a bottom line, should clearly be, have real concerns about a rule like this. This is a big deal. It has real world implications. And there are le legitimate, I think, reasons people want to look what the, the impacts of a rule like this are. I want to tell you this, though, and I hope that you will go into this discussion with, to some degree, an open mind and a willingness to look at some of the evidence. Jurisdictions that have developed rules of this nature have had both learning experiences in their early application of their rule, including Europe, where they have learned some things about how to do the rule with increased efficiency. But these systems have been very, very successful in both reducing pollution and maintaining robust economic growth. And I say this because I am interested in robust economic growth. And I am not interested in the alternative. But what I'm telling you is, after several years of researching jurisdictions that have used systems of this nature, I have seen multiple examples of success. That means ramping down carbon emissions and achieving robust economic growth. And what I've learned is, is done properly with sophisticated approaches and care and good listening to the business community, we can do this with great economic growth. And I would not be engaged, frankly, I don't think, in this particular measure if, if I wasn't confident of that. Um, and I just ask people to go into this discussion with maybe a, a little tiny bit of optimism here that we can achieve this if we do this the right way. And that's why I'm here to ask for your help. Does that answer the question? Yes. So okay. uh, raise your hands and self-identify if you would as you have a question. We've got about 20 minutes to go through questions. So let's open up the floor. Well, uh, we think it will work because they're not inconsistent. They are consistent. You can have a state mass-based system and a federal intensity system. They are not mutually inconsistent if you do it in the right way. And it's where the rubber meets the road. We've got to do it in the right way and not have wildly inconsistent expectations for the industry. So that's the, the key to this thing, to really look at the numbers and figure out how they juxtapose, but from a conceptual standpoint, there's no reason that they are inconsistent with one another. 
And there's no reason for the federal government to believe that they are inconsistent with one another. But we have to look at the actual numbers to make sure the numbers don't end up inconsistent with one another, if that makes sense. Are you communicating with them? With yes, but we haven't, I mean, we haven't got to the level of proposing numbers and showing that. We just haven't got to that level. Again, because we think we have to have a broader discussion first about what entities are covered by this rule. We have not only made any final decision about whether utilities are fundamentally covered by this particular rule. I think probably we'll be, and the answer to that will be probably yes, but we've, we have not made any fundamental decisions in that regard. But we don't see any showstoppers along the, the basis of your question. Well, I haven't made those decisions yet. I mean, I, I, I need to look at those advice to tell you what, what I want. I, I'm honest with you. I, I need this group to tell me how this could affect their operations, what the options are. So I don't have that vision statement. I'll give you the broad vision statement, which is we need a cap on carbon emissions from the major polluting uh, emitting entities in the state of Washington that is consistent with robust economic growth. That's about the best vision statement that I can give you. Now, I'm highly confident that we can develop that, um, in part because I've seen this succeed in many other jurisdictions, and in part because we have a very entrepreneurial group of business leaders in our state. And I'm serious about that. So I'm confident that we can succeed. I hope that answers your question. I mean, Well, the, the back of the, my mind is, is that, we will, that I will be able to tell the 7 million people that I work with that we are not going to sit around and let these forest fires devastate our state. I'm going over tomorrow morning, and I'm going to be meeting the people whose homes are burned down, and I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, you know, we're not going to just let this happen and do nothing about it. Now, that's one vision statement that I have. And I want to be able to tell them that we are going to have a system that will do our part to reduce emissions from major emitters. That's the best thing I can tell you right now. It's going to require a lot of listening to fill in the gaps. <laughs> now, when you say size, we do anticipate that emissions levels, because this is a mass-based system, will depend on, quote, size. If you're, yes, I mean, I, I don't know any other way to have a mass-based system that is not differentiated based on, quote, size. So maybe... So first off, I'd like to have your description about how you believe that would impact your operations so that we can look in that issue. I'd like to assess to what extent uh, it in fact does result in a disproportionate impact. I'd like to know whether those are fatal, injurious, troublesome, irksome, or de minimis. <laughs> where, where on that scale does that fit? Now, I have to tell you this. Um, no regulatory system of this nature is uh, what you might call perfectly egalitarian. Because anytime you have a system based on scope or scale, you're going to have some people above the line and some people below the line. And people who are in, just on either side of that line might feel disadvantaged. There is no way I've been able to figure out to solve that problem. We do not intend to have a permit system that requires a person to go out and get a permit to light up their barbecue. They are emitting carbon dioxide. They have an impact on our carbon footprint. To be perfectly egalitarian, we would require that man or woman with a barbecue to get a permit just like we would you know, maybe an aluminum plant to be perfectly egalitarian and, and rational as economists like to be, but we do, we're not going to do that. 
So what I have to profess to you is, to some degree, this is we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna bounce we're gonna hit some of those issues, and it's gonna be my job to fully understand your individual circumstances before we write this this rule, and I hope you'll help me to understand that. We'll obviously try to minimize that dislocation or unfairness. I can't tell you it'll be zero under this kind of situation. Well, um, I think there's uh, two ways to look at this in the gas industry. Uh, one, you could say that this does create some uh, regulatory limit on emissions, which is a troublesome thing to the industry. Two, you could look at it as, hey, this is great for our industry because our fuel is cleaner than some others because uh, we have less CO2 emissions associated with our product than some other ways to generate heat. And therefore, it's a competitive advantage for our industry relative to some other industries. So it's almost like a, half, uh, a glass half full or half empty in that regard. It helps gas because, frankly, uh, it gives it a competitive advantage against coal or perhaps oil. I don't really know the numbers that well for oil. So it creates a competitive advantage for this product that you now have a substantial investment in. On the other hand, there is some limit on the amount of emissions. So I guess you're going you're gonna to make that decision how to look at it. But the bottom line is, we need to reduce carbon pollution in the most economically efficient way to do it. And this is the best tool we have right now. So in the 102 process, there's an economic analysis that's associated with that rulemaking process. Um, I'm not sure it's a little different than the, the fiscal note process. It's not exactly the same process, but it kind of gets you to the same type of, of analysis. So yes, we will be looking at, at those issues. I, we will endeavor to do that. Anthony? But but I, I look I, I will say this though in that you know maybe I'm on my soapbox here a little bit but in every regulatory uh, potential w whenever there's a governmental entity that is considering a regulatory activity the obvious and appropriate concern of business leaders are costs associated with their businesses that's obviously something that's entirely appropriate. But I have to tell you, as governor, I got to look at the other side of the ledger, which is what our state's going to look like when my grandson's my age. And I got to tell you, the costs of that are beyond imagination, how, what our state's going to look like when my grandson, he's five today, when he's 64, what my state's going to look like if we don't do something here. And I believe we are capable of doing something here. I know what businesses are capable of our state. We, are, we reinvent entire industries. We're curing cancer and building the world's most efficient solar cell in Bellingham right now. We're building carbon fiber for electric cars and BMW. We're doing some great stuff in this state. And I believe we can do this. And if I didn't believe that, maybe I'd just run up the white flag and tell my grandson, go fish. Oh, there'll be no fish. Um, that's how I start this discussion. I don't know the answer to that. I, we, I do not have the answer to that right now as far as intrastating or interstate trading. I really don't know. I do think that the, the permitted, uh, the permittees, uh, we do have the authority to honor permittees uh, transferring those permits between each other, at least within the state. We do believe that is an answer we can give people today. And that obviously is a good thing for business. It is most efficient. It allows uh, businesses to utilize the least cost alternatives. It gives them the greatest flexibility. 
And I do believe that we can honor at least a private market that would be established uh, to allow that type of transfer mechanism that has been very successful in multiple other uh, jurisdictions. Now, the issue that I know you would be interested in is can a credit system be developed that would allow sequestration of carbon to have an economic value? That is a possibility. We don't have a conclusive answer to that question right now, but it is a possibility. Certainly, it was one that we made great progress on during the development of this legislation that, that we worked on for months. And by the way, during that legislation, let me comment on how we got here a little bit. I, I should have done that. Let me just comment. It's history, but it's important history to comment on. Uh, we tried assiduously a legislative uh, tool in this regard. And uh, where we ended up was is that the Democratic House, uh, if we had a prospect of progress in the Senate, I'm confident would have moved um, a cap and trade system through the House of Representatives. The votes were, to, were there to do that at the end of the session. They were not there at the beginning of the session because we had to do a lot of fine tuning on the bill. And it took us a couple months of a lot of work to do that. But when we do that, when we did that, we got to the 50 votes we would have needed to pass it out of the House. But it was quite clear that the Senate uh, was not going to entertain any action on climate change uh, because it has dominated uh, the majority caucus by those who frankly don't believe this is worthy of, of action uh, in our state for a variety of reasons. So uh, we did make progress on this issue in the House of Representatives in the Democratic caucus. Uh, then, uh, when we looked at a low-carbon fuel standard, as you know, uh, the majority coalition in the Senate adopted this poison pill that said, we don't think people should be able to take a bus and breathe clean air at the same time. They should have to make a choice between those two things. Now, for the life of me, I don't know why you should have to choose between having clean air to breathe and your kid not getting asthma and getting on a bus. I thought that was the most underhanded, uh, obnoxious, undemocratic thing I've seen in 25 years in public life. Nonetheless, it was in the bill. So I made a tough call and I listened to a lot of people who said, we think we ought to have buses and the ability to breathe clean air. So I didn't implement it. We, uh, we decided not to go that route because I think we ought to have buses and I'm proud of the achievement we had on a bipartisan basis on this transportation package. But we have to find another route here. So we're uh, moving in this direction. And we do intend to move in this direction. I do want to make sure people understand this. There's not going to be any more poison pills here. People need to understand that. This poison pill thing is history. The state's going to move forward to give our kids a chance to breathe. And we are going to act with your guidance and insights and criticisms all of which are important. I want to make sure everybody understands what we're doing here. Uh, several things. Number one, uh, we ought to be think about that seriously because it's a serious question, number one. And I intend to do so. Number two, we look at, in the design of any of these regulatory systems, ways to give businesses the most flexibility that, they can, that we can create to allow the most efficient uh, use of our capital in these markets. And that's why this credit trading system is something that I am very interested in that will give flexibility to businesses to transfer amongst themselves these credits which any economic model shows is the most efficient and ends up in the least cost to businesses. And here's the reason why. If you have business A that can achieve a ton of savings for $100 and you get business B to get a ton of savings cost $200, you would rather the business that can do that much more cheaply to be the one that actually invests the capital to achieve the savings. So in any economic model, you would want to develop a system to allow the maximized uh, benefit for the use of our capital. I learned that in you know, Econ 101 at the UW. Um, and so that's why this is an important potential flexibility tool. And there may be many others along that line. 
Secondly, we should be aware of uh, energy intensive trade dependent businesses that might be adversely potentially affected by a rule like this and to look at their specific challenges to see if there's ways to deal with that. Now in the legislation that we proposed, we proposed some ways to ameliorate if not eliminate that concern. How much of that type of thing we can do in this rule is something we want to explore. We don't have the full answer to that in that regard. But the fourth, and this is a hard one because I understand anyone who has a bottom line is justifiably concerned about any additional cost structure. I think I understand that. But I will tell you again, I will come back to this. If you look at the real world consequences of carbon constraint regulatory systems, there is more than abundant evidence that a properly constructed one is consistent with robust growth. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I talked to the Prime Minister of Quebec the other day. I was in Toronto at this international confab of people looking at these systems. And they've had a system somewhat like this now for several years, and I asked him about it. He says, look, we have not lost a single business as a result of this regulatory system. And I said, not one, I don't, you know, not one. You look at the UK experience, which has had robust economic growth vis-a-vis -vis its European partners, and they have had a very successful cap and trade system in that regard. You look at our eight Northeast states, so our eight Northeast states adopt the REGI program 10 years ago? 10 years ago. So they've had a program like this in place, albeit just in the utility sector, for 10 years. And their economic growth has been consistent with the rest of, of the nation. So I guess what I'm saying is I think there's reason, if we do this right, that we can respond to that concern. And we intend to do it right because I hope you'll help us. And I hope you'll understand what impact this might have on your business. And I'm serious about this. We've got the high sign. The governor's got to run. Governor, I want to thank you for coming over here today. This is a truly important conversation for mm -hmm. all of Washington and, and the business community. We look forward to having a continued dialogue. We need to have more dialogue on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. We'll be talking.